Annyeong! Welcome to Delightful! Our team of evolutions is growing fast, and today's edition will be Umbreon, the Moonlight Pokemon. It took me a while to create a concept for Umbreon that I really liked, which is why I have so many sketches to show you guys this time. First, I wasn't sure if I wanted to make all of the dolls girls or have Umbreon be male, so I drew sketches for both genders. The Pokemon's design draws inspiration from both sleek, mysterious, ninja-like elements and Egyptian, almost Anubis vibes. I tried to explore and combine these inspirations. Several of the designs I liked, for example, I thought the white-haired designs were striking, but perhaps strayed too far from Umbreon's character. The one thing I want to keep consistent through this series is to stay true to the feeling of the Pokemon. So while some of these designs were alright, they got cut in favor of a more Umbreon-esque look. Finally, I came up with these two. And at this point, I was forced to decide on girl or boy. To be honest, I preferred the girl design at this point, but you guys let me know on Instagram that you really wanted to see a boy doll. I was down with that, so with a little more, okay, a lot more, concepting, and a great deal of critiquing with fellow artists and friends, I finally came up with a male design that I, and hopefully you, like. With that huge brainstorming session behind me, I could turn to making the doll. I prefer Ever After High bodies to Monster High because they're more grown up and macho. I only have two boys left with this body type, Hunter and Alistar. Although Hunter is a bit darker and therefore a better candidate, I'm actually going to use Alistar. If you've watched my videos for a while, you'll recognize this doll from the time I stole his hair and gave him a bald spot. So the poor guy needs a makeover. Using acetone, I take off the factory paint with scooping motions. I usually give a final wipe down with an acetone soaked tissue. Next, after boiling some water, I dunk the doll in for about 30 seconds to soften the vinyl head before yanking it off. With a sharp pair of thread scissors, I remove what's left of his hair. To finish the job, take your longest pair of needle nose pliers and pick the stubble out from the inside. Sometimes you can use a scraping motion to take out a whole chain in one go, which is oddly satisfying. Now that he's nice and clean, I have no need for his human ears, so off they come. Any of you fellow customizers out there wish Mattel would just sell blank dolls before the reroute and the paint and the clothes? It would save everyone involved a little trouble. <laughs> just a thought. Anyway, it's time to change his skin color. Now with my previous attempts, I started with a base body color that wasn't too distant from the new color I applied. You just have to go in expecting chipping and rubbing off around the joint area, so the closer to the original value, the better. However, this is a pretty big jump, so let's see how well I can do this. As usual, the vinyl head takes the acrylic airbrush application very well. Only needed two coats. As for the body, I won't be using the airbrush, but instead thousands of layers of Mungyo Soft Pastels. First of all, I'm roughing up the body with a fine grain sandpaper in hopes that it will help the pastels adhere. My YouTube buddy Seasonal Frostbite is a pro at color changing dolls using this method, so I have faith this will work. So, one layer at a time, I would work in the pastel using a medium sized brush and circular motions, pressing the pigment into all the nooks and crannies. When it wouldn't build anymore, I took him outside and applied generous amounts of Mr. Super Clear. If you try this, remember to bend the joints and spray those too. I am spraying the doll with MSC between each of these layers. He went through several phases. At first he looked like a guy who just really needed a shower, then the poor guy looked like some kind of burn victim, and then finally the pastel built up enough to look like a legitimate skin color. I was definitely worried for a while there. So finally, once I'm satisfied with the opacity, I'm going to paint on two coats of DuraClear Matte Varnish. Remember to water this stuff down a fair amount or it'll turn out shiny. The Mr. Super Clear did a great job of holding down the layers while I applied the next one, but I don't trust it completely. Once that's dry, the hardest part is done. And would you look at that? To be honest, I'm pretty impressed. Paint would already be chipping off, but because the pastel is such a fine dust, it's staying on. If you don't want to invest in an airbrush, this is a great alternative method. I mean, it looks airbrushed because there's no paint strokes of course, and dare I say it, it's staying on much better than my airbrushed Leafeon's body, so win-win. The downside was that I went through just about half a can of Mr. Super Clear, and naturally I had to wait through all those dry times, so it took quite a while, but 
There it is for your consideration. I'm calling it a success. On to his hair. To make the dreadlocks, I'll be using this fine yarn that basically already looks perfect. Using Elmer's glue all, I spread out the tips to form a nice surface, then glue them to the head one by one. I will be rooting the front of his hairline because his hairstyle is partially swept back. So for the rooted sections, of course, the hair needs to be double in length but half in volume to match the rest. Many of you liked hair design A, but others pointed out that would cover up his forehead O. I was also pretty excited to try a dreadlocks hairstyle for the first time. It gives him that African aesthetic that I really wanted to accent with this design. I actually got lucky, I just barely had enough yarn left to finish this hair. It was the perfect amount. I already used the rest of this yarn to make a sweet pom-pom for my beanie. Let's switch to his clothing. I stitched up a pair of pants with contrasting pockets using a modified pattern that was originally ripped off from a factory-made pair of Ever After High pants. For a guide on how to copy doll patterns and more tips about making doll clothes, see my other videos about exactly that. To form his belt, I braided three turned knit tubes and stitched the ends in place. Using an old can, I cut out and fashioned the ends by clamping down on the metal with pliers. Of course, be careful when you work with sharp metal like this. I formed the belt's pendant out of my favorite epoxy sculpt and made the tassels from red thread and jewelry bits. I made the ears and tail by sewing and turning casings, inserting some wire, and putting some stuffing in to flesh them out. One reason I had so much trouble making a male concept for these Eevee dolls is because of the ears and tail. I mean, put big ears and a tail on a person and it makes them look cute, right? Not exactly manly. They work well on female characters and maybe androgynous characters, but it was difficult to get them to look acceptable on my macho Umbreon. I scaled them down and have them facing back, which I think still looks cool and not stupid. <laughs> I hope. Using the same acrylic paint, I draw the signature circles onto his arms and body. My gold paint is very transparent, so I put a layer of cream down first. Looks more vibrant that way. Face up time. Now we have the same problem as with Katrine Demute. I enjoy painting on a range of mid-tones because you can easily push and pull your values by applying darker or lighter colors. But when you're working with either pure white or pure black, in other words, the ends of the spectrum, you don't have that liberty. And that makes Umbreon a bit of a challenge. I block in the basic shapes and expression with watercolor pencils before switching fairly early on to acrylic paints. Umbreon is a mysterious character of the night, so I really want to render his red eyes so that they pop out. I ended up not giving him a pupil. I didn't want to break up that nice red gradient effect I had going, and I think it makes him look even more mysterious. I'm painting on a subtle maroon tint to the lips, and also adding details in black acrylic paint, which of course you can't see at all. I'm bringing out some highlights on the lids and Cupid's bow. And let's not forget the forehead circle. And those fun little eye shines. Ding! At this point, he's still pretty hard to see. I mean, you can't even make out his eyebrows. Luckily, my husband is a 3D character modeler and he had some great advice for me. 
He said, when working with single colored objects, the best way to differentiate assets is through texture. So taking that to heart, I applied many layers of gloss varnish to his eyeline, pupil, and nose to set them apart from his matte skin. And for the eyebrows, I glued on small pieces of the actual yarn I used for his hair. And I love how they came out. They help give him a sterner expression, and I think the difference in textures really does make him look complete. And it may be too late at this point, but before anyone writes it in the comments, I am well aware that most Eevees are in fact male. Both in the games and what I've seen in the anime. It was simply a personal design choice to make them female up till this point. Let's finish him up by stobbing in his ears, securing them from the inside, and reattaching his head. And with that, Umbreon is complete! In the end, I am glad I decided to make him a male. I think he turned out very handsome, and the group has variety now. It's starting to look like a real Pokemon family. Have a good night, and thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time for... Can you guess? It's Vaporeon. Stay artsy! Annyeong!